Welcome, everybody, to another awesome episode of Rock Talk with the Doc Rocker. I am Jeff Bedoma. I am joined once again in the Zoomiverse by the Doc Rocker himself, Santa Arlotto. It's been a long time since we've sat down to do a podcast. How are you doing? It's 2022. It's 2022. Happy New Year to you and to all of our viewers. Um, it has been a long time because uh, as, you know, especially people who follow our channel know, you know, because a lot of us are musicians, you know, we all know how much December and Christmas time, while wonderful times of year, they suck for musicians. They're just incredibly busy, you know, with concerts and rehearsals. And especially for me speaking personally, you know, now that we're entering this uh, optimistically thinking post pandemic world where things are open back uh, back up and people are vaccinated and you know I, I myself had a bunch of Christmas concerts I got to play with a bunch of um, kids for schools uh, in the Westchester area which was awesome but it was also really busy so we had no rock talk time for quite a while and then the holidays of course we took off and then last week we took off for my birthday and jeff had a gig so we're finally back we're going to do an actual episode um and then later in this month we're planning to also do like a kind of regular wrap-up kind of session where we look you know across the facebook group page and check out all kinds of interesting i know jeff posted a bunch of interesting stuff i posted a bunch of stuff a lot of our members have been posting really cool things the last couple of weeks there's lots going on in the music world yeah. so we'll definitely oh, yeah, just you know, just 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 yesterday, there was a big uh, conversation on our web board about uh, your top five metal singers. Like, who do you like the most? The top five, and we got a lot of uh, a lot of submissions. Lot of, for that. Really interesting yeah. comments on that one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of stuff going on in the metal world. Absolutely, and I like yeah. how you're very optimistic about the end of the pandemic. I'm not as optimistic as you, but yeah. Well, just... this, this Omicron thing is definitely fighting and saying otherwise. But like, at least before Omicron came in, like at late December, like all throughout December, it was like, oh yeah, we're kind of like back to normal now. <laughs> at least where I live, you know, it's like it was. It felt relatively safe to go out and about and do things, and it was, it was just a roller coaster ride. It was like I'm still catching up on piles of paperwork that I was hoping to do before the end of the year, but I'm still catching up. But anyway, fingers, fingers crossed that this wave is the last. Wave. I don't know. But what are we talking about today? What, so what's so the, we're going uh, to do a bit of a deep dive into um, album mixing techniques, um, talking more about like how mixes sound across different styles and different time periods, um, and especially more about a particular recording strategy of like what kind of sound you like to make in the studio. You know, we're going to throw in some live albums, and I know Jeff has a bunch of uh, references prepared, a bunch of uh, specific examples of things. Uh, so we're just going to have some fun talking about that uh, and start a conversation for all of you. Yeah, let's let's start with uh, the beginning of what is known as the modern sound or the wall of sound. Uh, before we get any further, we'll, we'll do a shout out to the wall of sound creator. Uh, it's also known as the Spectre sound now. I don't want to say Phil Spector is a, is a good guy because he's not, but he did invent the wall of sound. So <laughs> we won't get into Phil Spector, the person, just Phil Spector, the guy who created the wall of sound and how he did. <laughs> yeah, that could be a whole exactly. different rock talk topic. We can do that with a guest yes. maybe some other day. We'll get someone yeah, really. on that box because that's a whole. Yeah, we can talk about all the horrible people that you have to separate the art from the artist a lot of times, you know. And yeah, it's, not just it's unfortunate, it's but it's true. That's right. So, okay, back in the 60s, the wall of sound um, was created and developed by Phil Spector. Um, now, one of the misconceptions is it was created simply by maximizing noise and distortion, which is not completely true. Also, multiple instruments doubling and tripling many of the parts. That's how he created the wall of sound. And that's pretty much how modern recording is done. I mean, when you get down to the basics, they follow pretty much the wall of sound. And they go, they go from there, you know. Um, now, when you're when it's stuff like this is mixed well enough, um, a lot of times he would do like acoustic piano, electric piano, and like harpsichord, we'll say. And if it's mixed well enough, uh, most people can't distinguish between, you know, the three of them, and it just kind of blends into one instrument, you know. And like he would do stuff like that, and that's how he creates such such big powerful albums back in the in the in the 60s and then it you know bled into the 70s and the 80s and and, and now you know yeah. and pretty much 
every that's major how it, stylistic genre pretty much followed suit. Like this works. Right, this is a right. great recording technique. You know, the simple use of just multi-tracking for things to make harmonies and duplicates, you know, speaking as a guitar player and as a vocalist, you know, there's the possibilities just go on and on and on. And, you know, especially all you metalheads out there can think of all of your like really famous like twin lead techniques from like the 80s, especially, you know, all you singers out there. Uh, th th there's a lot you could definitely pull all the way back from, like, as Jeff said, the, as early as like the late sixties where that. Yeah. I mean, a lot, like, you know, sometimes, so, sometimes you don't even know, like a lot of people don't know this, like that rhythm guitar that you're hearing on your favorite album, maybe like three times layered, you know, it may, it's not just going to be one guitar. It, it'd be three different tracks you know on top of each other playing the same thing to get that to get that sound it's a lot easier now with computers mm. and stuff to do it yeah but, people you know, can do it the themselves day, literally it's incredible right yeah right and, and, you know like, a lot of people take it for granted now that's like that's just how you do it but i guess back in the day it's like you know they didn't really didn't really think like you know yeah. so someone had to try it first and come yeah. up with that yeah. idea and it really took off and changed the world as we know it for music one thing that I thought of when you mentioned this topic was how the sound has changed uh, with metal albums from like the late seventies, early eighties until now, like the seventies and eighties metal sound or hard rock sound always like washed with reverb, you know, there's like reverb everywhere. Like uh, the big fat snare sound of like uh, Scorpions rock you like a hurricane. There's like everything had reverb on that song. You know, yeah. if you listen to just the, everything has reverb um and then they could get to the 90s and it's like there's no reverb like it's almost like a gate on them uh, on a lot of these instruments uh it was really like no reverb at all like just not yeah. and it, it, it's a lot of that it, it's like that today too uh which is really interesting like just a change in style you know uh yeah yeah definitely you're not gonna hear this is this this big fat you know 80 snare drum now you're gonna hear the snare drum is real tight and sometimes it, you know even higher pitched almost like a marching snare you hear a lot on uh these newer metal albums i hear like it's like a marching snare compared to like that fat concert snare that you used to hear with like the 80s rock bands you know even even like uh the maiden you know like yeah. their, their sounds changed a lot too especially because of their you know our producers i actually like the maiden sounds the maiden mixes in the eighties a lot more than I like them now. I don't like the mixes of their albums now, but they're still so good. It's like, I could see past some of that. Yeah. Like comparing the stuff that they did like post 2000 with Kevin Shirley and comparing that to the stuff they did with Martin Birch back in the eighties. Like a lot of people, uh, at least fans in the community that I follow usually lean more on like the Birch camp. Like, yeah, the Birch yeah. mixes are way better. Um, yeah. I actually really, really like both. Uh, I, I love the sound they got with Kevin Shirley. Um, I'll admit it's not as clear, uh, but I kind of like that murkiness of it. It makes it feel kind of darker to me. So it, it, just yeah. for me, especially because in my case, I kind of grew up with all the later albums because I'm a little younger than a lot of the fans. So I, I like both. Uh, it's, it's definitely a matter of taste and a matter of flavor. It's, it's essentially uh, just as much a part of the aesthetic as who your lead singer is or what style of playing your lead guitar player brings to the table or, you know, like choosing to do like, you know, world percussion stuff in addition to drum set, you know, it's like that you, when you, when you think about how you set up your mix and how you make your sound, that's just as much of a creative process as the actual music itself. You know, what notes you're playing and the rhythms you're using to play them. I've always found that part of it really interesting, especially because, you know, as a music teacher, I know all of like the musical elements, but I really don't know much of anything about like the sound design elements. You know, I'm, that, that, that's a totally like uncharted territory for me. Like I've dabbled and played with things, but I really don't know much of anything about it. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of how I do Yeah, I, I've, I've dabbled with mixing stuff. Um... Yeah, I, like I've recorded a thing or two here or there for people, but yeah. like nothing like super serious and nothing that's really like on the surface. Like I don't have anything on Spotify, you know what I mean? But I always like collaborating with people who know that kind of stuff. That's yeah. always a lot of fun. I can tell me. though, like, you know, I, I can listen to an album and, you know, sometimes it's like, wow, this would be a great album if it wasn't such a terrible, terrible mix here. You know, like yeah. Metallica is one of them I'll mention right <laughs> now, you know, 
Like, <clears throat> I don't know if St. Anger is a good album or not because I can't get past that terrible drum sound, you know. And it, going back to when I was in high school and Justice for All came out, and a lot of people didn't like the mix on Injustice for All because there was no bass to it, you know. It's huh. kind of weird. Yeah, that makes sense. There's yeah. no bass. They, 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 they turned up, like, there's a bass player on the album. They just turn them down really, really, really low because it's Metallica. Because they're like, Cliff Burton died. You're our new guy, so we're going to turn you down. Which, I don't I've always liked the, the mix in, on, on Injustice for All is weird, but I always liked it because it was different. And I remember going back, you know, when I was in maybe 11th grade or something when it came out, uh, everyone was trying to get that sound on their bass drum, that clicky sound. That, like it's, it's really prominent now in, in a lot of metal music now. But like back then, Injustice for All, that clicky sound on his bass drum. Um, and I remember reading somewhere, one, I think it was Modern Drummer Magazine, someone came up with an idea of, of duct taping quarters to your bass drum and, and using a, like a, a plastic beater to hit them. It kind of worked. Um, if you if you went down into my basement right now and looked at my old bass drum, they still have uh, from from back then. There's the duct tape. tape. The, <laughs> yeah, there's still quarters tape there. There's That's awesome. There, where my double pedal would hit, it it gave a decent, like a closer sound to that. But I remember people were going after that sound. Everyone wanted that drum sound. No matter what people say now. I remember back then people wanted that drum sound. Just the drummers I knew did. I, I always thought that drum sound was 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 pretty cool. Uh, the, one of my favorite drum sounds ever is from Countdown to Extinction, uh, the Megadeth album. That drum sound is just whoever mixed that was just like. Awesome. Is that around the same time period? I don't know. That's the one um, that came out right after the that came out after the Black album came out. So like, oh, okay. Megadeth and Metallica kind of were going back and forth, like. Uh, like Unjustice for All came out, and then like two years later, maybe Rust in Peace came out, and then like the Black Album came out, then like a year later, Countdown to Extinction came out. It's kind of it was kind of like that. Oh, okay. Um, but the drum sound of Countdown to Extinction is like one of my favorites. Uh, it's so good. Uh, huh. That whole album I think is mixed really well. But Metallica. One more thing about Metallica that I have not notated here: Ride the Lightning. Uh, Ride the Lightning. That album. A lot of people don't like that mix either. It's, it's kind of it was probably because of uh, it was probably a money thing, you know. If the first two albums by Metallica aren't mixed that great, Kill 'Em All's not mixed that great. But it's a great album. Ride the Lightning, same thing. I love this. My favorite Metallica album. It's like, but it's buried in this like low frequency reverb. If you just listen to the instruments, there's like reverb everywhere, and it's like it's the '80s. That's what they did, you know. Even Hetfield's vocals, there's reverb everywhere. It's just like he's in an echo chamber, you know. Yeah, which is completely different than what they do now. Yeah, yeah, it's funny because you talk about like the the inconsistency of of Metallica's mixing uh, in their albums. Like it's like you could tell it's Metallica because of how the musicians sound, but like from a mixer's perspective, it's like each of these could be easily a different band. You know, from album to album, there's just so many drastic changes in style and yeah. temperament, and it's it's just nuts. Now, one of the albums that I, was mentioned um, by my brother-in-law. Uh, when we're talking about singers, we were uh, he mentioned about Phil and Samo from from Pantera, and it got me thinking. Like Cowboys from Hell has such a different mix for the time that it came out because that I want to say it was like eighty nine, ninety or something. Yeah, yeah, eighty nine. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, so like you're still in that eighties kind of reverby kind of thing with all the metal bands, and uh, Pantera comes out and. They, <laughs> Cowboys from hell all that is, out the window yeah yeah all out the window. Yeah, it has yeah. such a such a modern sound even now like i was listening to it um it was definitely uh, a good time yeah i was listening to it at the beginning of last month i was revisiting a lot of pantera and uh on a side note I, oh man phil man he used to sing really well man yeah Does, there's, there's, there's great that. stuff especially on cowboys every time i go back to cowboys yeah. i always forget how good the vocal the vocal parts are and like, like, I, I like Rob blown type. away every time. Yeah. yeah. It's such a, yeah, it's such a range on them, but that's, again, it's another rock talk we could go into. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that mix is another one. Uh, 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 Cowboys from Hell, as far as, you know, that goes, you know, that mix I think was ahead of its time. It really was. Uh, we could talk about live albums. I know you're not really fond of live albums. Yeah. Well, but... yeah, l let's talk about it. Well, live albums aren't usually totally live. 
<laughs> yeah, th that's th that's actually something I did not know at all. Since I don't really listen to live albums, I always just kind of took them at face value. So so talk a little more about that. Well, okay. For instance, I'm reading Rob Halford's uh, autobiography right now, um, mm -hmm. which is a fascinating book. Uh, he really... <laughs> He doesn't pull any punches. Like he does, he goes to some dark areas, we'll say, in his book. But it, it's fascinating. But one of the things he said was um, the Juice Priest live album that came out in the early 80s was a live album that they recorded when uh, they were over in Japan. And he was having problems with his vocals. And he knew, like, when he heard the tapes that he wasn't, it wasn't going to be a great performance. So he, he said, like, a lot of people, have mentioned to him before uh, they didn't think this was recorded completely live. So Rob admitted this in his book. Nope. He went into a studio and re-recorded the entire thing. Now he claims he did it in one take. He claims he walked into a, 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 a recording booth, you know, hooked everything up, started playing the, the, the album and just sang it, you know, right through then whatever came out, came out. And that's what's on the album. He claims. Okay. You know, but it's not, it's not well, the fact the that he re-recorded it in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Is, you know, is you know what, though, it's, 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 it's fine. What do you, you know, what are you going to do? There's a couple, I know even, even Rush has admitted to going back in and doing just a couple little things here and there on their live albums, a little touch up here, a little touch up there, you know, um, now <laughs> the Iron Maiden live album, a real dead one. I'm pretty sure that's live. That was the last, pretty much one of the last things recorded before Bruce left, and Bruce didn't sound like he was into it at all. Like it's, if you want to hear Iron Maiden kind of at their worst, you know, with Bruce, uh, I didn't like that live album at all. Like yeah, it is out of the Maiden albums, that one's definitely. I've listened to all the Maiden live albums because I know that's such a big part of like their thing, um, and we could talk a little more about that in a minute, but. Out of all the ones I've listened to, uh, that one is by far the least memorable. <laughs> With that said, one of my favorite live albums is Live After Death by Iron Maiden. Yeah. I yeah. like how they perform the songs on that album, especially like um, Flight of Icarus. They played a little bit faster. Uh, they played a little bit heavier. Uh, I like that album. I, I tend to listen to that album a lot more uh, than like any other like live album. Uh, I'll listen to uh, Live After Death and uh, Ozzy's Tribute, uh, the Ozzy Randy Rhodes album. That's another one that's really good. Um, Ozzy's Speaking of the Devil is pretty good, too, just because of how that was put together as a live album in like two days. After Randy Rhodes died, there was, I guess it was like a contractual thing that Ozzy had to do another live album. Randy Rose has been dead for a couple of months. He pulls in Brad Gillis, a couple other guys. They practice for three days. They do a bunch of Sabbath songs and they release it as Speak of the Devil. That's a pretty good live album. Huh. I never heard of that <laughs> yeah, one. I'll have to go give it a listen. That, it's all old, it's all old Sabbath stuff. Like. Yeah, Brad Gillis is a great guitar player. I mean, he does, he does some really cool stuff and you know his interpretation of his old sabbath songs it's, it's pretty it's pretty good it's yeah, pretty good for what it is to hear that yeah yeah speaking of yeah. devil's pretty good um but yeah some live albums like i said are not as live as as you think they are but some are you know so yeah. and, and, and that to me is like really really funny because like it kind of defeats the whole purpose of like why you do a live album in the first place right because right. like you know going back to maiden that's like one of their things like oh we want we want all of our studio albums to sound like a live experience. So we like go in the studio and do everything and just like one or two takes. And like, we try to purposefully make it like really raw. And if there's any kind of like mistakes or discrepancies or anything like that, we leave all that in there. Uh, and, and that's always, I mean, that's, that's always part of like what they're going for and that's their style and that's how they play it. And that's great. And it makes the live albums, you know, as effective as they are and they're really good. But I don't know for me, like, I've never subscribed to that mentality before. Uh, it's actually probably the, the biggest thing that I dislike about Iron Maiden is like the, that they do that. Cause like, if you're in the studio, you have all the chance to like dig yeah. in and like tweak stuff and re-record and make it perfect and make it like really, really good. And there's bands, I want to say Rush is like that, right? Well, they'll, they'll like do surgery and like make it absolutely perfect before they shelter. Well, yeah. Right. Most you know. of most of the prog bands are gonna be like that. Like Dream Theater is a Yeah, sure Dream Theater is definitely like that. that. Like and that's always why that's maybe that's part of the reason I gravitate so much more toward progressive stuff than I do 
more heavy stuff. But looking at some of Maiden's albums, like how they go for that sort of live aesthetic, even in their studio albums, like every time I go through and listen to studio albums, like especially with Maiden, like I notice all of those little details those little differences yeah. like if bruce comes in like a little bit early for a phrase or if there's like a a drum groove pattern that's not consistent or if there's like a noticeable like note that sticks out like it always like as a listener for me it just like frustrates me to no end of like why would they not like go and polish that if you you have all that time in the studio something that someone's gonna listen to ten thousand times why not make it perfect you know do you hear do you notice a lot more of that in the newer albums or the older albums more in the older albums honestly um especially it's funny enough that it's one of my favorite albums but the biggest offender i would say is somewhere in time where there's like noticeable like tempo changes that i don't think they planned you know uh bruce especially uh some of some of his timing is like way off where he's like coming in super super early on phrases or late or you know and like you you could chalk it up to like yeah maybe that's the way they're going for it like in a in like a live concert or something like that but it's just so inconsistent and the way that the 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 musical phrases should line up based on context of what's going on in the music like to me as a musician that like that album always hits a nerve for me when i go through it and i'm like they should have just did another take you know like i never got the idea that bands like to me it, it it sounds like a i hate to say it but it sounds like a lazy excuse like ah yeah we'll just do like one or two takes and that'll that'll be it and it'll make it sound more authentic like no like you're in the studio like make it like really really good you know like <laughs> No, no excuse, man. No excuse. That, that drives me nuts. I hate that idea so much. But that's just me, you know. And that's the whole. It's all. It's a matter of taste, and it's a matter of aesthetic and opinion and all that. So it's not really. There's not an objectively good or bad way to go about it. But 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 bands that go for that like live feel in their studio albums, always piss me off. <laughs> well, you mentioned somewhere in time, which I think that and and Seven Sun have to me the best mixes of any iron man oh the mixes are awesome and that's a part of the reason i keep going back i get drawn back despite that major flaw that i don't like everything else about the albums i love you know the yeah, sound I... design the synthesizers the progressive style of the songs like those are two of my favorites they're, they're always a tough tie for me but for any any album you can you could think of right now that like is a great album but like the mix is terrible oh <laughs> My brother Adam's going to hate me for saying this, but, you know, because 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 we're both big fans of Periphery, you know, and th yeah. those guys are awesome. And their first album is arguably one of their best stylistically, artistically, musically, you know, and, and it's one of those like it really put them on the map and it's got a lot of incredible pieces. I have such a hard time going back to it after hearing how much their sound improved mix wise for the second album. And even like every album just gets better mix wise from a mixer's perspective, as far as periphery goes, like P2 is mixed way better than P1. P3 is mixed way better than P2. And it's like when, when P3 came out, I was like, this is the peak. Like no one can get better than this. And then P4 came out yeah. and it sounded even better. It's like, how do they even, but like, I would love, and I know, I know I, I've said this. <laughs> I've said this Money to Adam before, time. and he doesn't agree because Adam loves the first album and listens to it more than I do. But I yeah. would love what they should do is just completely re record the first album. You know, note for note, song for song. Don't change anything, just re record it and mix it better. Because I, I think the mix and the sound and all the stuff on that album, mix wise, is no, it's, it's, it's a completely different league below what they've done since. And I would love to hear you're, them revisit it. You're opening up a can of worms, though, by going back and re-recording, though. That's yeah. a problem. Like, I understand why you'd want to. Here's here's an example from a band that I love, Megadeth. Okay, he, they, he went back, Dave Mustaine went back and started messing with Rust in Peace. If you listen to Rust in Peace's um, uh, remaster, uh, he re-recorded some of the vocals. Some of the vocals are different they're not he says the same things he sings the same things but you can hear it's a it's different it's some different of the bass lines are slightly different there's a different sound to them especially uh the the song take no prisoners if you listen to that the original and you listen to the remaster they re-recorded like most of the, most of the song it's not the same it doesn't feel right you just there's something there you know it's it's 
that feel that was there at that time when they recorded you can't get that back so even That's though really you want yeah even if you want periphery to redo it i would say no because they'll it may sound great but they may mess it up and dave mustaine i i, I still i still say he messed up the remastered version of Rust of Peace by doing that. Um, another song he did it to was Five Magic. Some of them are some of them are the same. Some of them, the vocals are you can hear it. They're different. Uh, there's just different different uh, the way he his inflection is uh, the way he sings. You know, mm. it's it's 20 years on. You know, yeah. Uh, when he remastered it, it was 20 Even years. If he sang it exactly the same way. It would still sound a little touch different just because he has a 20 year older voice. Right. And you're probably in a different studio with different, you know, it just, it's yeah, just different, different instruments, you know? different strings, different, everything is just, yeah, a don't mess with, yeah. I say don't mess with, you know, like these days, um, as far as mixing goes, like these days, everyone tunes like way the hell down, you know, so yeah. like a low yeah. B or, or whatever, mm-hmm. um, and which is like a world apart from the standard E tuning of like way back when, you yeah. know, so it's like, I think that's why like in the eighties can actually like hear things more. You can pick things out more in the mix than you can in a lot of these new metal bands because everything is like the down tune guitar is competing with the bass a lot of times. So mm. sometimes the mix are a little bit muddier. It's at least to my ears, my old ears. You know, like I can hear a bass line better like from like a, a band from the 80s or early 90s than I can now mm. um, because everything's so low, which makes yeah. it heavier. You know, um, I know I did. I kind of. <laughs> went off on a little tangent there. We yeah, were talking about like, Megadeth, but I just, you know, I just remember I wanted to mention that about like like new stuff, m- mixing new stuff with the bass and hearing the bass more prominent in like older stuff most of the time. But yeah, Megadeth did that. A couple bands have done that. Sometimes it succeeds, sometimes it doesn't. I don't think Megadeth, uh, Ozzy did it. Ozzy did it for a completely different reason. Uh, Blizzard of Oz, the first album, one with Crazy Train on it, Apparently, they didn't want to pay royalties to the original drummer and bass player. <laughs> so when they re-released the album, they had Robert Giulio, I believe it was, and Mike Borden on drums re-record the bass and drums huh. to the Blizzard of Oz album. I don't think you can find the album anymore recorded like that because it was such, there, was such, there was such a fan backlash towards it because they didn't even hide the fact that they re-recorded the drums and the bass. Yeah. Yeah, well, you gotta respect them for being honest about it. Like, hey, we're gonna do this for this reason, you know. Oh, yeah, I totally get that. Even if I don't agree with it, you know, I, I totally get that that's what they would do. And that, that, uh, that, that's really pay, you know, we don't want to pay Lee, Lee Kearslake, you know. The poor drummer was dying, you know, in a, in a hospital bed. They're like, ah, oh, we don't want to pay him anymore. <laughs> yeah, I can we're see why the fans. Drum. I can see why the fans might be a little upset with that decision. That that, that doesn't seem that doesn't seem so. It nice. is. It is. You know what? It's interesting to listen to it though. Um, the slight again, the slight differences, the different, the differences. Oh, yeah. in it's literally a different person playing the part. So yeah, really you can you can find it. You difference. can find it online on 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 YouTube if you want to hear like their version of Crazy Train, which sounds different. You know, huh. um, you know their version of that album, that whole Blizzard of Oz album. I think they, they may have done it with their Diary of Mad Men also. I'm not sure, but I know they did it with Blizzard of Oz. Huh. So <laughs> that's pretty interesting stuff as far as you know, mixing and, and changing things around and re-recording stuff. You know, yeah. Well, 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 there's one thing to be said about like going back to an album that's already been made and then like kind of touching up and like re-recording a certain part or recording over it or something. But, you know, I'm, I'm wondering for like what, what it would be like for a band after they've developed a better sound to revisit older musical material and just record that from scratch as if it was a brand new song, you know, yeah. like literally strip it all down and start over. Something like that yeah, would always some... be pretty fascinating to me, at least. I know Bloister Cult has done that with a few of their songs. They've re-recorded oh, really? and like reworked some of their songs. Oh, that's um, cool. Some, See, I like stuff like that. That's awesome. The song Astronomy by Bloister Cult, I think, appears on like three or four different studio albums. And every time it's different. It's a different version of the song. May, uh, Metallica did a cover of Astronomy. You may be familiar with that because you probably have never heard of Astronomy. is like my favorite song by Bloister Cult. It's an excellent song. Huh. And there's, I, don't think I've I know there's at least... There's at least three different versions on three different albums by BOC, which is kind of cool. Uh, but um, Maiden did it with with uh, with Bruce when they went back and re-recorded Prowler. They re-recorded uh, Charlotte Harlow. Now there were B sides, but they you know they did them with Bruce. Yeah, I never heard those. I don't think hmm. I've ever heard those. Whatever 1988 was, because I think it's called Prowler '88, and it's it's a re-recorded oh, okay. version. Well, yeah, that would have been after Seven Sun then. 
Yeah, yeah, it's probably Seven Sun Four or something like that. Yeah, huh. that's pretty yeah. cool. I'd love to hear Bruce on some of those songs. Yeah, as much as I love Paul Piano and I love those first two albums with his voice. Some yeah. people don't like. Some people don't like how he sings Prowler or 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 Charlotte the Harlot. I do. I think it's great. You know. So yeah, I'm sure they're awesome. I like them. Yeah. <laughs> that, 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 funny enough, that, that's another thing I, I ended up not enjoying listening to the Live Maiden albums because some of them I listened to, like Live at Donington in '92. I listened to that live album a lot. That was because it was yeah. one of the first albums I got from them. So that was like my greatest hits, like just hearing them do it live on the two discs uh, on the CD, like that that came out. But um, just hearing Bruce do like Wrathchild on all the live recordings for me like none of them come close to how it sounds on um, the original and killers with paul diano mm-hmm. you know yeah but, and, and, and you know it's, it's like well they were written for paul they're written yeah. for paul diano they definitely were and, uh, yeah. i, I I'm, yeah. I'm laughing because i just i'm at the part of rob halford's book where he talks about he was trying to seduce paul diano to one night oh to like perform with with him no, 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 oh, no. Oh, just straight up seduce Alfred, him. Uh, seduce him. Like, like oh, hey, like, you like want to go back to my room? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is amazing. It's just a small part of the book, but he was like, <laughs> I was too drunk to do anything, and Paul's too drunk to fight me. Because <laughs> you know, back back then, they, they, they toured together when Deanna was in the band. For, I think it was um, on the Killer's Tour, made an open for Priest. And Paul Deanna said, we're going to blow Priest off the stage, you know? Like Paul, it was a famous thing. Like there, that's that's where like the the feud comes from. Was Paul Diano said we're gonna blow Priest away, you know, and because huh. it's Paul Diano, you know, um, and some of the guys from the Priest camp weren't too happy about that. Well, sure. You know? and, and then Rob <laughs> was talking about wanting to hook up with Paul Diano, the one that I don't know. That's funny as hell. Like I said, the book goes some crazy places. Let's just say that. It goes that. off the deep end a couple of times, it sounds like. It goes some crazy places, which was interesting, though. I just can't, uh, I don't know, I can't, uh, whatever. <laughs> whatever flows <laughs> over, man. Oh, my God. I just can't see Rob Halford trying to make out with Paul Diano. It's, it's just this vision in my head. It's just weird. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, okay, enough of that. Um, those Those albums those maiden albums uh going back to you know actually how they're mixed they're very raw those first two are so much like and again it's a money thing they were probably done in a cheap studio on cheap time and yeah. they probably only had you know 15 hours to get it right and off you go in the middle of the night you know compared yeah. to when they became you know huge like great with, new with world maiden. yeah <laughs> yeah or not even or even like what uh, number the beast you yeah. know, look at, look at what Killer sounds like and look at what Number of the Beast sounds like, you know. Yeah, it's a pretty noticeable difference. Even comparing uh, the, the, the first two albums, like even just from the self-title to Killer, oh, yes. like there's a huge dip, uh, bump in quality, yeah. I think, as far as the sound goes. The way that Diano's vocals are tracked, the way that the mm-hmm. mix is, I, I still think that mix really holds up exceptionally well, despite how old that album is and how quick they probably threw it together you know you have your right. whole life well, to write your first album and then a year to write your second yeah well you know the first album was 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 pretty much an indie album like that was you know not recorded you know under like a, a huge a, a big record label or anything you know mm-hmm. just like black sabbath album what they recorded the first album in eight hours or something or 12 hours or something for like 800 bucks you know that's insane <laughs> or some, some, something ridiculously cheap like that couple hundred dollars they went into a studio and banged out banged out an album which is one of the best metal albums i think of all time yeah it's more blues album but you know <clears throat> whatever and that's and that's another thing like i i like to listen to these older albums when you listen to their mix their mix is so simple and a lot of times like if you pan it hard right or pan it hard left you're hearing different things, which is cool. They used to mess with you in headphones like that. You know, like with Sabbath, like a lot of times, like the guitar is only, uh, you know, in one channel, like off to off to your left, you know, is the guitar, you know, yeah. off to the right is, is the drums, you know. Which to some listeners, it's kind of cool because it's like you're in the room with the band and you can hear yeah. more of the guitar from the left, you know. Yeah, I it, mean, it, it, it's it's interesting kind of, it's interesting stuff, especially those older albums. We can, you know, you can mess with them and listen, you know, to 
how it was done and it was pretty simple back then and a lot of it was probably with, with sabbath at least it was a money thing you know it's like i don't have cash <laughs> yeah you know <laughs> you know and the, the record label probably was like you know i don't know who the hell you guys are but we're not going to drop a couple thousand dollars on here's 800 bucks you go do something with that you know yeah you know yeah. <clears throat> um there's one another thing i wanted to mention about like mixes today compared to mixes of yesterday like back <laughs> back in the day they didn't compress the hell out of everything like they do today you know like like the dynamics were more in place that gave you more of like a natural mix to wherever you were recording nowadays like you could press a button and you could have whatever mix you want yeah you know? which so i like, like the, the <laughs> yeah, well, it makes it a lot easier like you know but um yeah making everything perfect is also another thing that like takes away the human factor of some bands now for instance like dream theater they got to be right on because that stuff is just so precise you know, complex and stuff if it wasn't right yeah if it wasn't precise it would sound like garbage you know yeah. what i mean you can't yeah. you can't have it even a, a little bit off but something like like a group oriented band you know uh, or like a throwback band like like crowbot or greta van fleet or somebody like they probably will will do better without that quantization stuff and without it being exactly perfect you know it, it breathes more life at least for me i like albums that kind of have that to a point you know getting back yeah. to what you're saying like you know sometimes bruce will come in a little bit differently on an, on a you know a, a vocal line than the last time he did to a point it gives it a little bit of a human factor, maybe, but like we never, we'll never know. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like yeah. does it make, make it or break it? I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's definitely, you know, like I said before, it's a matter of like personal opinion, you know, where it's not yeah. inherently wrong to do it one way or the other, but you know, it, you do it one, one way, a person of this particular taste is going to love it or they're going to hate it. So and it, it depends on who the band is and what genre of music too. Yeah, and like, what they're known the, for. The, what are the expectations? You know, like Dream Theater, you got to be precise. Like, and you have to be able to hear it. Has to be clear. That that mix has to be clear. You yeah. know, and 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 precise, like you said. Black metal, not so much. You're going for an atmospheric kind of thing. You know, right? Like sometimes, like black metal, the 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 crappier the mix is, the better. You know, right? Because it helps really kind of, drive yeah. that kind of emptiness and despair. Yeah, yeah, that lo-fi sound that they're that they're trying to get. They don't want it to be overly produced and glossy, you know? Uh, a right. lot of things, a lot of people blame, like, the end of the 80s hairband stuff on the overly glossiness of the mix. They just, they took, like, all the aggression out of all these songs by mixing them differently, bringing the guitar back in the mix more than they should have, you know, to make it more palatable to... A wider uh, audience, a, yeah, a, a pop music audience, you know, a yeah. pop radio. So yeah. you got that too, you know. And it becomes yet another factor that ties into that whole kind of counterculture movement, like in the early '90s, like as a stylistic yeah. response to what happened in the '80s, was like a purposeful, a purposeful, deliberate. Let's take it in completely the opposite direction, you know, like you talked about before, yeah. like taking reverb away from mixes entirely in the '90s. Mm -hmm. I think it was directly a response to what it was like in the 80s first where like, you know, and you kind of see that musically and stylistically. And it's 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 cool and eye opening to me as a musician to see that it's also happening from a mixer's perspective. Like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, we're going to put in this new recording technique and then it's going to be something that takes off. And then every band does it and tries, you know, and spends a decade trying to replicate a new sound that has been cultivated or created and then eventually someone is going to be the pioneer of a movement of we're sick of that that's that's tired and done let's throw that out and not use it anymore so let's do away yeah. with it so i've always found that kind of thing to be pretty interesting it's a lot of fun to explain. Oh, absolutely and, and i think it's really interesting because i don't know much about it like i never really dug into yeah. like mixing and recording it I, I i did mix an album i recorded an album with um with the last band I was in with there and back and we recorded an album back oh god 2006 and trying to mix that I mean I never mixed anything before so it's just like you know it's it's um I really would like another go at it because I think the mix is terrible 
you know, there's, there's a bunch <laughs> yeah. of musicians sitting around. We never mixed before, so we didn't know what the hell we were doing. Right. You know? I wish I still had the raw tracks because I would like to throw it into like, you know, the technology I have available to myself now. Um, mm. Maybe I could get a better sound out of it. But... And, yeah, and like revisit some of that old material. I always like that idea of like going back and trying to refine mm. and polish it. Yeah. But then again, but I'm a bit also... of a perfectionist. You know, that's how I, that's how I, you know, write. And that's the kind of music yeah. that I like to consume. So that's just me. Don't let the referee do it though. I think that would be bad for everyone. Everyone says that, but I, I, I'm I, I'm a bit stubborn in, in in my viewpoint. I would love to hear them redo their first album from scratch, just record the whole thing again. I think it would be it would be terrific. <laughs> but that's just me. <laughs> and that's the way the world goes. <laughs> that's the way, that's the, way the, the way the news goes. goes. Yeah. The name the- yeah, yeah, the way the news goes. Yeah. I wasn't sure if that was what you were referencing or if you just said a said a common thing. I was trying to ref. I messed it up though. <laughs> the way the news. You ruined it, Jeff. Oh, <laughs> it's been one of those weeks, man. Yeah. That's all I got. Yeah, that's all I got too. That was fun. Good talking to you again. After so long, what was the last one we did? Thanksgiving week, I think. Did we even do one so, Thanksgiving yeah. week? I think we were we were gonna do a whole like revisit the whole like what we're thankful for kind of thing, and we. I don't know if we ever actually got around to doing that. We did that last year. I know that. Yeah, uh, when yeah. We were... When we started, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I, I did. I, I did the. I did my my top five albums from twenty twenty one. I did that by myself because you couldn't do it, <laughs> uh, and I'm out of nice. boredom. But uh, well, that's fun. Know. Yeah, it was fun. But we could yeah. we could we could revisit twenty twenty one again if you if you'd like to. Yeah, In no. The meantime, We'll move on. We got some new topics. We, there's always there's tons yeah. of new stuff going on. So we'll so we'll meet again in another week or so, and we'll and we'll talk about some new stuff. And it'll be fun. That's right. So in the meantime, of course, if you haven't subscribe to our YouTube channel and join our Facebook group, Rock Talk with Doc Rocker, and keep rocking. Yeah. And if there's anything in particular that you know you guys that, that are watching, if there's an album that you want us to check out, as far as like, oh, this album has an awesome, amazing mix and it changed my life. You should listen to it. Or if it's this album is great, but it's completely ruined by a terrible mix, you should listen to it and pick it apart and rub salt in the wounds. Let us know. You know, <laughs> we're, we're always looking. We we always love when uh, other members get engaged and post content. You know, it's so much more than just me and Jeff. There's a whole bunch of us. There's a lot of people that get engaged and it's always a lot of fun having those conversations so keep rocking and we'll keep talking